Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the rule and the underlying legislation. This rule provides for consideration of three bills intended to give our country more necessary tools to tackle the opioid crisis. The three bills this rule makes in order today were all reported favorably by their committees. H.R. 5735, the Transitional Housing for Recovery in Viable Environments Demonstration Program Act, was the subject of a hearing by the Committee on Financial Services on April 17th as we, and was reported favorably on May 22nd with a bipartisan vote of 34 yes votes. H.R. 2851, the Stop the Immigration, or I'm sorry, the Stop the Importation and Trafficking of Synthetic Analogs Act was the subject of a hearing by the Committee on the Judiciary in June of 2017 and is reported favorably in July 2017 by unanimous voice vote. The final bill made in order by this rule is H.R. 5788, the Securing the International Mail Against Opioids Act, was reported favorably in May with a unanimous voice vote. Together, these three bills provide the foundation of the House's legislative response this week to the opioid crisis wrecking lives and communities across this country. Mr. Speaker, the Eastern Plains of Colorado has been my home for many decades. I often refer to the area as God's country. It is full of good-hearted, hard-working people who care for their families and neighbors. Many of these people work the land and provide services to those who do. They farm, they ranch, they produce energy resources, they transport livestock. And when hardship and disaster strikes, neighbors move heaven and earth to help each other. They grieve over loss and bear each other's burdens. However, it is not an unfamiliar refrain to hear that in the heart of this God's country is a disease plaguing our people. All across this land, in rural towns and suburban developments and urban neighborhoods, abuse of opioids is wrecking people's lives. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, approximately 64,000 Americans died of a drug overdose in 2016. Of that number, 65 percent, or 42,000 of those deaths, were directly related to the opioid epidemic. That means that every day, 115 people die due to opioids. Well, thou, while those are astounding numbers, it helps to compare with past figures. In 2000, 8,400 people died due to opioid abuse. These recent numbers indicate a nearly 500 percent increase. That's shocking and sad. Colorado has, been spared, has not been spared from the opioid crisis. In fact, the CDC reports that in 2015 alone, Colorado saw 159 heroin overdose deaths in addition to the 259 prescription drug overdoses. This is particularly harmful to my district with eight of the 17 counties in Colorado exhibiting the highest overdose death rates being in eastern Colorado. As some of these figures indicate, our opioid crisis is not just prescription drug abuse. While many who are caught in the cycle of abuse began with prescriptions, the availability and accessibility of heroin has perpetuated and intensified the crisis. Most of the heroin on our nation's streets comes into the United States through Mexico. It's distributed via cities like Denver in a ruthlessly efficient manner. An entire delivery system is established in which orders can be placed to a central operator, essentially a franchisee of the cartels, who dispatches a, dr a delivery driver to the purchaser. In February of this year, Detective Nick Rogers of the Denver Police Department testified before the Judiciary Committee how criminal operations f flow north through Mexico and from other places such as Honduras and Nicaragua. Heroin dealers enter our country illegally with fake identification from Mexico and establish these distribution networks in neighborhoods. In the past, our law enforcement officers were able to apprehend these criminals and have them deported. Recently, however, local government policies have been having a negative impact on these police op operations. Places like Denver have instituted so-called sanctuary policies that prohibited, prohibit local law enforcement from working with federal immigration authorities. The effect has been that law enforcement officers, such as Detective Rogers, apprehend the same drug dealers over and over and over again. They are prohibited from contacting federal immigration officers to help control this scourge. This is confounding to many of us. We should be facing this crisis using every tool at our disposal. We could continue discussing at length how sanctuary policies, while well-intentioned and sounding humanitarian, 
are having a profound negative impact in relation to the opioid abuse. But there is other work that needs to be done to stand in the gap against this onslaught of bad actors. Mr. Speaker, in 2016, Congress passed and the President signed into law the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, or CARA. CARA is the most comprehensive addiction treatment legislation passed by the federal government in several decades. It coordinated federal response with state and local efforts to prevent, treat, help recover, and provide justice to those who are suffering under the impacts of opioid abuse. While that bill was a good step, the bills before us today continue to organize federal efforts to meet this public health and legal crisis. The first two bills deal with a gap in the federal law that has been exposed by this crisis and exploited by international crime organizations. That gap is synthetic drugs. According to the Drug Enforcement Agency, there are more than 300 known designer synthetic drugs, and this number grows with each passing year. The gap in federal law occurs because the Controlled Substances Act was not designed to deal with the ever-changing compounds that have resulted in more than 300 synthetic drugs. It currently takes us about three years to complete the process of placing a substance on the banned substance list. If we attempted to ban each drug as it was discovered, in the time it would take for our government to complete its action, criminal gangs would simply change the molecular structure just enough to avoid our laws, and we would be forced to start the process over again. Because of this scenario, H.R. 2851 sets up a streamlined process for temporarily placing a synthetic drug on the illegal drug list. This will empower the Attorney General to respond quickly to criminal drug manufacturers in China and Mexico who work continuously to stay ahead of our drug laws. Not only do we work to streamline the process of banning a substance in the United States, we also are working to prevent substances from reaching our shores in the first place. H.R. 5788 requires the Postal Service to obtain advanced electronic data on international mail shipments and transmit this data to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP. Under current law, private shippers, including express delivery carriers, are required to collect and submit this same information to CBP. Because current law does not require this information of the United States Postal Service, we have a significant vulnerability that allows criminal operations to ship synthetics and other contraband directly to the United States with relative ease. This legislation simply closes a loophole by extending the requirement to the United States Postal Service. The data collected will allow CPB to target high-risk shipments, particularly shipments containing synthetics, for inspection and possible seizure. The first two bills deal with bad actors overseas. The final bill attempts to heal those afflicted by opioid abuse transition back to normal life. H.R. 5735 creates a pilot program in which a portion of existing housing vouchers are set aside for transitional housing for those who are undergoing opioid use disorder or other substance abuse disorder recovery. In March of 2017, President Trump established a commission to, tra to strategize on how to combat drug addiction and opioid abuse. The final report of that commission said there is a critical shortage of recovery housing for Americans in or pursuing recovery. Recovery residences are alcohol and drug-free living environments for individuals seeking the skills and social support to remain free of alcohol or other drugs and live a life of recovery in the community. Mr. Speaker, oftentimes individuals who complete recovery programs re-enter life having lost everything. They are in danger of falling right back into the rhythms of their previous life, which could lead them back into addiction. This bill ensures that they have a supportive housing situation to help them become reestablished in their community. Over the course of the next week, we are going to pass nearly 30 bills dealing with aspects of the federal response to the opioid crisis. These three bills today take major steps towards keeping the flow of drugs out of our country and helping those who are caught in the cycle of dependency become successful members of society again. I know I speak for my community when I say that we need to be active in combating this scourge of opioid abuse. The flow of opioids and synthetics into our country from overseas must end. The lives of many of our loved ones depend on it. 
I support passage of these bills, and I reserve the balance of my time.